Hello, and welcome to the Sino Babble podcast. Apologies for the late upload of this episode. My house is currently under construction, so it's been a bit difficult to find a quiet time to record. Also, in general, my life at the moment is just a little bit of a mess, but we're pushing through, and we finally made it to the last episode of the Nanjing Decade. So far, we've covered culture, economics, feminism, and academia. But I wanted to save the episode on politics until very last because I feel like it ties together all the other threads that we've been talking about really nicely. We've gotten a few glimpses of the Nationalist Party's governance and policy formulation in a few different areas, and we've seen how they try to exert control over different parts of Chinese life. But we haven't really addressed the topic of KMT politics in and of itself. Although in recent years many aspects of the Nanjing decade have been reevaluated in a more positive light, one negative connotation that seems to have stuck is the accusation that the KMT were fascists. Although actually the KMT themselves wouldn't have seen this as a negative label at the time, and in fact there's a lot of evidence to show that they actively strove to model themselves on other successful fascistic regimes, but we will get to that shortly. So what we're going to be doing in this episode is reviewing all the evidence, taking a look at the ideology of the nationalists, as well as examining some of their major social policies and campaigns to see to what extent the term fascist can be applied to the Nanjing government. The term fascist is one of those elusive terms that often escapes simple definition. If you asked someone to give you an example of a fascist regime, they could probably do so without much hesitation. But ask them to define exactly what makes that regime fascist. That's a little bit trickier. Every time I want to discuss or write about fascism, I always have to look up, if not a definition, then at least the major bullet points as to what makes a fascist regime. There are lots of different places to get a good overview of fascism, but I usually tend to revert to Ur fascism, written in 1995 by Italian philosopher and literary critic Umberto Eco. If you haven't read it, I highly suggest you do. If for no other reason than it's really well written, it's a personal essay, and it's actually kind of funny in places, despite its dark undertones. I don't know to what extent it counts as like an official or academic definition of fascism, but it's handy as a sort of everyday, straightforward outline of the main things to look out for. Eko's essay lays out fourteen main features of what he terms eternal fascism. The main reason that I like this system is because it's non-formulaic. It's not as if you don't fulfill all fourteen criteria, therefore you are not fascist. It's a bit more flexible, kind of like a mix and match system. As Echo himself points out, some of the features even contradict one another, and being contradictory is actually a characteristic of fascism in and of itself. The main criteria are as follows: a worship of tradition paired with a rejection of modernism. Lack of diversity and discouragement of disagreement, encouragement of action for action's sake, and the desire to become a hero, constantly seeking conformity, simplicity, strength, struggle, and even warfare, the promotion of a sort of uniform, paranoid populism that is constantly seeking out those who are different or who might be trying to tear down society from within. And the creation and use of simplistic but effective newspeak that can be used to control the public. I think right off the bat, if we just cast our mind back to previous episodes, we can already spot some way in which the KMT conforms with some or even most of the characteristics listed to a lesser or greater degree. However, I still want to go through the political setup and major campaigns of the regime so we can get an accurate read as to what extent the nationalists were truly fascist. And now I've said the word fascist so many times, so I'm going to try and avoid the word as much as possible. You already get what it is that we're talking about. Okay, so the first thing that we need to know is what type of government exactly the nationalists had installed. It was essentially a military dictatorship with Chiang Kai-shek as the leader of the party, government, and military. Their aim was to carry out the second stage of Sun Yat-sen's revolutionary plan. Which was to have a period of political tutelage before full transition to democracy, which was the third stage. If you want to know how they were planning to go from military authoritarianism to democratic republic, you should look at Taiwan because that's where the nationalists went when they got kicked out of China in 1949. But anyway, we'll be talking about that in a much later episode. 
Some of the ways in which Chang established control we mentioned in the first episode on the Nanjing Decade, but as that was quite a while ago, I'll refresh your memory. There were purges and suppressions of those who disagreed with his tactics or the party regime, such as the communists and left-wing members of the party. He re-registered all the members of the Nationalist Party in order to weed out radicals, he banned mass movements not organised by the government, and also banned youths and young people from taking part in politics altogether. The Nationalist Party itself was sidelined in favour of the military, which didn't really make too much of a difference, as about half of the party members were soldiers anyway. It wasn't really a surprise that Chiang wanted the military in charge. He was a soldier himself, he was used to commanding soldiers, and he was used to operating people as if they were sort of units in an army. In order to strengthen the militarist control of the country, he even had 25 of the 33 provincial leadership positions filled by generals. Also, as we discussed in the previous episode, the majority of the budget went towards funding the army, about two-thirds of the national budget across the whole Nanjing decade. When the Nanjing government was formally established, the government was broken into five main departments, or UN, that ran the country, but these bodies were largely ignored by Chiang, who just bypassed the formal structure of government whenever he needed something done. Also, he staffed all the important offices with his friends and loyal followers, who in turn staffed the lower offices with their own lackeys. I just want to pause here and quickly point out that we've already fulfilled two of the criteria for a fascist government in the first five or so minutes of the episode. The purging of the communists and forcing everyone to re-register for the party, as well as diminishing the role of the party so that the leftists could be suppressed properly, definitely meet the criteria for seeking out enemies from within and the idea of constantly going through some sort of struggle or warfare against one's enemies. This is a big trope in the Nanjing decade. I guess the warfare was kind of a byproduct of the time. Technically, when the Central Plains War broke out in 1929 and the warlords tried to topple Chiang Kai-shek, he didn't start that and his only choices were to fight or surrender. But chasing the communists around the country and trying to eradicate every last one in the encirclement campaigns, that was all Chiang. It's not as if the nationalists were militaristic by coincidence. Like I said, Chang was a lifelong soldier, and if you remember from about 10 episodes ago, Chang had actually been in charge of training up the cadets when the nationalists were still based in Guangdong province. As it turns out, these same military school graduates would end up forming a key component of Chang's fascist regime by forming one of the top factions that Chang used to govern the country. These military loyalists were made up of the former trainees, now generals, and went by the name of the Wampoa clique. They were actually one of three cliques or factions that were in charge of running the country, as opposed to the actual government offices that Chang didn't really want to use. The other two cliques were called the CC clique and the political study clique. Don't ask me why the political study clique didn't get a cool name. The CC clique was run by the two nephews of Chang's former mentor, Chen Jumei, who had been killed by Yuan Shikai way back when. The two Chens ran the bureaucratic administrative branches of the Nanjing regime, such as education and labour. The other group was the political study clique, which was just a fancy term really for a bunch of Chang's really smart friends. They didn't run anything as a group per se, it's more that the individual members would be in elite positions in finance or education or military affairs. Some of them weren't even members of the Nationalist Party, so that goes some way to explaining why they didn't have much swing with the other members of the party. These groups didn't really get on with one another. The one power clique felt that the others were just opportunistic bureaucrats and saw themselves as the sort of purest, righteous arm of the party government. Also, Chang didn't really do anything to discourage this conflict, unless it became physical, because having all of the different factions at each other's throats, instead of cooperating with each other, meant that none of them would become powerful enough to ever oppose him. Governance and political position with China at the time was less dictated by skill and expertise, and more by personal loyalty to Chang, who would bestow favour and good positions on those who he felt supported him the most. This is why the Wampoa clique were in charge of the more secretive and moral elements of government operations. 
Because it was made up of generals and high-ranking soldiers that Chang had trained himself, he could trust them to be blindly loyal and carry out his general will, whether he stated it explicitly or not. The structure of the Wampoa clique is a little bit complicated, just because it's just really multi-layered and has lots of subgroups and informal bodies that acted somewhat independently of each other. The main group within the Wampoa clique was called the Li Xing Shi, or Society for Vigorous Practice. They were a secret organisation that controlled the secret police, parts of the actual police, the Boy Scouts and propaganda through its various front groups which were the Revolutionary Army Comrades Association, the Revolutionary Youth Comrades Association, the Renaissance Society, and the Blue Shirts Society. I feel like everyone who talks about fascism in China in this period mainly focuses on the Blue Shirts, because they're kind of like a knockoff version of similar groups that you would have found in Italy or Germany at roughly the same time. However, Usually these narratives kind of miss out on the fact that the Blue Shirts were part of a broader organisation, but that's because the Li Xing Shi, this vigorous practice society, was actually really good at being a secret society. Most people didn't even know about it until very recently, whereas the Blue Shirts and other front organisations were meant to be the face of the operation, and so most people knew about them really well. So what exactly was the operation? The Blue Shirts were essentially in charge of enforcing the moral rectitude of the party and the nation. They were basically the ultra-nationalist paramilitary wing of Chiang's loyalist government, though they were never publicly recognised by Chiang Kai-shek, and admitting one's membership in the group was actually strictly forbidden. Their aims were completely geared towards installing a more fascist regime. They wanted to make the army fascist through military classes at the political training institute, make the party more fascist by driving out the other cliques and making sure no one could threaten Chang's position as now Führer, as they called him, and improve the country's finances by encouraging self-reliance and promoting agricultural production by helping farmers to obtain loans through peasants' banks so that there would be more economic support for fascist movements. Their number one goal, however, was the eradication of the communists. Once this was done, and the whole nation's political and economic systems had been centralised under Chang's leadership, and the people had been unified, then the whole country would go through an amazing period of revival, followed by unprecedented development. The Blue Shirts also stressed complete obedience to one's superiors, probably a hangover from their training in being personally loyal to Chang. They were often labelled as fascist in contemporary newspapers, and though the press meant to demean the group, whose membership was in the low tens of thousands at the time, they really took the label to heart and kind of appreciated being called fascist, and they even seriously encouraged Chiang to model his style of leadership after that of Mussolini. Chiang, for his part, didn't balk at the offer, and he himself insisted that strength, militarisation and nationalism through the rejection of the frivolities of modern-day society was the only way to save China. Here we come to the principle of rejecting modernism for traditionalism, which is a key component of any fascist doctrine, but not to be misinterpreted as rejecting modern science and technology. Chiang was actually very enthusiastic about adopting the industrialising methods of the regimes in Europe that he admired so greatly, but he felt that the only way China's soul could be saved was through a return to the traditional core values that had held up Chinese society for millennia. Frederick Wakeman refers to this as Confucian fascism, and Confucianism absolutely did permeate through the ideology of Chang's ideal nation. In his speeches on the topic, Chang would often reference the key principles outlined in The Great Learning, or Da Shui, one of the four books of Confucianism. These principles are loyalty, filial piety, humaneness, charity, righteousness, peace and harmony. As well as being a militarised society, the people should be neat and tidy and have good manners and hygiene. It was kind of as if he was invoking the spirit of the junzi, or ideal cultivated gentleman that Confucius encouraged his students to become. Interestingly enough, even the name of the Society for Vigorous Practice, Li Xing, comes from the doctrine of the mean, or Zhongyong, 
one of the four books of Confucian philosophy that acts as a guide to perfecting the self. Wakeman argues that Chang's fascist militarization was just another way of teaching Confucian citizenship to the people. Though, again, the word fascism never actually passed Chang's lips in public, apparently. But he did frequently refer to the need for this fascist doctrine in his secret speeches to his closest followers. In 1935, he is said to an assembly of blue shirts, Fascism is a stimulant for a declining society. Can fascism save China? We answer, yes. Fascism is what China needs now the most. So we get it. Chang really wanted to be fascist and so did his most loyal followers. So they've got the kind of theoretical groundwork covered. But how did they actually intend to put the ideology of fascism into practice in nationalist China? Well, one of the biggest and most well-known attempts at a mass movement, largely orchestrated by the Blue Shirts and other groups within the One Poa clique, is known as the New Life Movement. We talked about this very briefly in the episode on feminism, but I'll try and give a bit more detail here, especially because it relates directly to the context of nation building and politics. Launched in 1934, Chiang Kai-shek declared that the aim of the movement was to militarise the lives of the citizens and the nation as a whole so that they can cultivate courage and swiftness, the endurance of suffering and tolerance for hard work, and especially the habit and ability of unified action so that they will at any time sacrifice for the nation. It was first announced in Jiangxi province, with the aim to transform society's appearance and the behaviour of the people in order to remake them as a precondition for ameliorating China's backwards economic state and improving the tattered social fabric of the nation. It was basically mental and physical prep for carrying out the next stage of the nationalist plan, which would have been full industrialization and the improvement of national defences. Many people at the time and later when looking at the New Life movement critiqued its focus on the more frivolous aspects of people's lives, like washing your hands and things like that. In reality, when I was trying to look up what exactly the New Life movement was, it was shockingly difficult to get a clear answer as to how the movement was enforced or how it was carried out practically in people's day-to-day lives. From what I gathered, it went something like this. Basically, there was a list of 96 rules published that stressed proper behaviour, actions and manners, such as greeting your elders properly, not visiting prostitutes, not gambling, being frugal at weddings and other festivities, uh, keeping left while walking. That one I actually really agree with, but that's probably just because I'm British. Suggestions were made for household cleanliness and for people to stop bad habits like drinking and smoking. And peasants and workers were called on to be more disciplined in their day-to-day life and also to be more nationalistic and less decadent. For example, by wearing native cloth and only using products made in China. But they didn't know at the time how much that would catch on. The Boy Scouts, who I mentioned were trained by the Wampoa clique and the Blue Shirts, were largely in charge of the mass comms of the movement. So holding mass rallies, doing nighttime lantern parades, theatre performances collective marriages and street sweeping activities, as well as handing out handbooks, singing songs and placing symbols about the New Life movement all about the place. There were also official inspections of hotels, shops, restaurants and theatres, which became more common at the time, and there was also some vigilante action as gangs of youths would attack those who continued to break the rules such as using imported goods or watching officially censored movies. We've also touched in other episodes on how the New Life movement seeped into different areas of Chinese life. For example, the debates about the new woman in the episode on feminism talked about how the Nanjing government wanted good mothers and wives as opposed to the preponderance of the faux modern woman that they felt that they were faced with. At one point, women wearing too much makeup or wearing a bobbed haircut, the symbol of decadent westernization, were actually arrested in the streets. The proper woman was the ultimate symbol of neo-Confucianism for the nationalists, as she had both a physical appearance and also a behaviour and demeanour about her that could be regulated, observed and corrected. In film, we saw how nationalist themes were encouraged and often even state-sponsored. 
especially those that targeted an unnamed internal threat that was basically a veiled reference to the communists. We also discussed how films and media in general were heavily inspected and censored when containing inappropriate content. In the episode on academia, we touched on briefly the government's attempts to investigate and ameliorate conditions in the countryside, and we even mentioned how they did try and correct some of the bad hygiene practices at the time. There were plenty of attempts made, but the New Life movement overall just didn't have enough time to succeed, and it definitely did not have mass support, which again could be attributed to lack of time. Like most things that the Nationalists tried out, They really only started going in about 1934, and then in 1937, they had the full-blown war with the Japanese to deal with. The New Life movement perfectly captured the hodgepodge nature of the government revving up for a bright future. The ideals of the perfect fascist regime were all laid out in the ideology and were beginning to be put into practice, and Chiang's closest and most loyal supporters were all willing to carry out his will, even if they were fighting amongst themselves. They all seemed to be moving towards this goal of a stable and secure militarised society in tandem. But in the end, though it seems like the Nationalists fulfilled the majority of the criteria to be worthy of the title fascist, I personally think they fall short in a couple of areas. The first and most obvious area is their lack of full control over the whole country. Throughout the entire 10-year period, the Nationalists never really did manage to gain control of the entire Chinese territory. Japan had occupied the northern part in Manchuria, the communists were just running wild, and they were still turning back the tide of warlordism until at least 1936. This lack of control meant that they were unable to build up their base, and they were always doomed to be missing the all-important populist element. Because they were constantly carrying out all these purges, and they were suppressing mass movements and the press, and they were stifling any sort of democracy from within or without the party, the nationalists actually prevented themselves from building up a popular base. They were so scared of encouraging dissent that they actively discouraged any mass participation in politics or even grassroots level leadership. By the end of the period, most students in the country had been pushed so far left that they were sympathetic to the communists. As we pointed out in the last episode, the provinces collected and controlled most of the taxes, and the Nanjing government was reduced to manhandling banks in order to fund their military campaigns. The nationalists were frequently at odds with warlords, capitalists and landlords, with whom they were supposed to be at least nominally allied, as well as people within the party ranks who had become disillusioned with the cause and didn't really believe in Chang's vision for an authoritarian militaristic China. At the end of the day, the regime was neither organised nor totalitarian enough, really, to be called truly fascist. Maybe pseudo-fascist would be a better term? Wakeman opts for a more diplomatic term, military dictatorship, that was constantly dodging the trends of capitalist individualism, as well as ducking and diving away from the socialist class warfare ideology. At least Chiang, the Li Xingxie, and the Blue Shirts, and to an extent the other leading factions, felt that fascism was the nation's best bet, and it was a natural fit, seeing as the country had been in the throes of all-out warfare, for over 20 years, and although they couldn't have known this at the time, it wouldn't be ending any time soon. The Nationalists managed to really fully embody these ideals of seeking out the enemy from within, carrying on constant struggle, wanting to be a national hero, demanding conformity, and upholding traditional values in order to strengthen the nation against internal and external enemies. However, the rest of the party and the country were just so disorganised, they were a complete mess, and it was just impossible for the nationalists to get their message down to the grassroots level. Just because you say you're fascist, and you really, really want to be fascist, and you want other people to call you fascist, it's not just about wearing the right clothes and saying the right things. It's something that has to be embodied, not just by the ruling elite, but by the whole people of the nation. And... Really, that's what the nationalists struggled with the most. Despite their much smaller size, this isn't something that the Communist Party struggled with, really, at all. Shirking elitism and using a completely different set of tactics to Chiang, Mao Zedong and his exiled comrades struggled for many years to build up a strong base among the ordinary people in the countryside, 
while also developing a strict model for indoctrinating not just soldiers, but ordinary party members and peasants into the ideology of the Chinese Communist Party. Starting from the next episode, we're going to be switching from the nationalists to the communists, and we'll be exploring just what exactly the CCP's tactics were for ensuring loyalty, starting with a deep dive into Mao Zedong thought. So, that's it for this episode, guys. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you tune in to the next episode.